right, it is the top of the hour. So let's uh, go ahead and start our presentation here. I am recording this. Uh, it will be up uh, on our YouTube channel, usually in about a week or so, uh, depending on uh, the workload, but uh, we should have this uh, ready to view here shortly. Um, three presenters, as I mentioned today, my name again is Brian Reel with uh, CATI or Computer Aided Technology, uh, based out of our Kansas City, Missouri office. And uh, again, I'll just be doing hosting duties for today, but we do have three presentations. The first uh, from one of our coworkers, one of my co coworkers, I should say, Ritesh, is going to uh, talk a little bit about um, the platform uh, as far as best practices um, in, in the revisioning of, uh, of documents inside the 3D Experience platform. Uh, second, we have Kevin Burney uh, from SolidWorks uh, Dassault Systems, and he's going to uh, introduce or show us how the user interface team works with uh, with data and uh, with other customers using the product. And then uh, last but not least, we do have Lisa Costa also from SolidWorks Dassault Systems. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Um, and she will be going through, um, I love her title, Not Your Father's Bomb Management. Um, so again, more information about the uh, product release engineer role uh, there is also a document or a handout that is available uh, in the task pane within the GoToWebinar interface. Uh, feel free to download that document. It has more information about her presentation as well. Uh, so without further ado, I will uh, pass this over to Ritesh. Uh, Ritesh, you are ready to share your screen. Uh, again, any questions you come across, please put those into the question chat, um, and I will answer or ask those to the panelists so that they can answer uh, as they go through or towards the end of their presentation. Okay, thanks, Brian. Appreciate it. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, all is well. Okay. So uh, my name is Ritesh Dalal. Uh, I'm with uh, CATI. Uh, we're going to just go through some uh, revisioning uh, within the 3DX platform. Uh, this will be a kind of a high-level overview of just how re revisioning works uh, within the platform. So let's get started here. So just some features uh, with revisioning. Um, in the 3DX platform, you can have multiple revision schemes. Um, there's multiple that you can choose from. It's all configurable. Uh, you can create multiple revisions on an object without releasing that object. So if you have an object that's in a frozen state, you can have multiple um, revisions uh, while in that state. It does not have to be released. Um, you can have primary and secondary revisions as well. Um, you can access the latest revs. Um, through the web client or from the SOLIDWORKS connector piece. Um, you can also apply different transition rules to the life cycle um, of an object's revision. And you can save revisions within a bookmark folder, update revisions within a bookmark folder, and I'll kind of show you that uh, on one of our last slides. So really the purpose of a revision, uh, just for, for those of you kind of new to it, or at least within the 3DX platform, um, revisioning really just allows the user to see changes to an object. Um, they're going to allow the tracking of changes that are made to an object um, with a historical trail, right? So anytime you make any kind of update or revision to an object, you will see a historical trail for it. Uh, so you can see who did it and when they did it and, and see that tracking. Um, you know, when you have drawings, parts, assemblies, any of those things are modified. Um, usually the, the suppliers, customers, users, whoever it may be, they're going to need to see what those changes are. Um, the revisioning attribute just allows for that in the platform so that everyone can see it all at once. It's all dynamic. Um, revisioning versus versioning, I think this is something in the platform, I think we used to call it versions. Um, it really is revisions now at this point. Um, you do have the option kind of, I, I want to say you have the option for revisions and versions. Um, it, it, once we get into the platform, you'll see that a revision really is your um, primary and your version is your secondary. And again, once we get into the section about primary and secondary revisions, you'll kind of, that'll be outlined a little better so you can understand that. Um, so let's get into some of that, actually. So we talked about earlier how you can have multiple revisions, um, even without an object being released. Uh, so this is kind of highlighting some of that. Um, depending on whatever your configuration setting is for this platform, you will have the ability to have multiple revisions that are in work 
um, that's what this example is below. Um, you could have it in a frozen state if you'd like as well. Um, so there's different states that you can have multiple revisions from. It doesn't necessarily have to be just in work. Um, if a new revision is allowed to be created from an in work state, you will have this option that you see below. Um, if a new revision is only allowed to be created from a frozen release state, then you will not have the ability to create multiple revisions from the in-work state. So if, if you look at this kind of image here below, this is showing you that uh, there's a setting there in the access rules section of the environment. Uh, this is what I meant by configuration. Uh, so when you go into the configuration side of it, um, on the bottom side, under lifecycle operations, you do have the option to allow new revisions on certain maturity states. Um, in this example, um, we've set it up where you can make a new revision, whether an object is in work, frozen, or released. Okay, so if you have just released in that sense, right, then you cannot create multiple revisions. Okay, the only way you can create multiple revisions uh, on something um, is having it in these states. So revision schemes, um, when we talk about schemes, just different ways that you can kind of rev up an object. Um, there's two main options um, with, a, with a little bit of a variant too. Um, the primary can really either be a numeric or an alpha. Um, if numeric is decided, decided, you can either start with a one or a zero, um, or you can go with alpha um, and you can see alpha is ABC. There's also an option where you can omit or skip the I, O, Q, S, K, or X and Z. Um, and you can see the options there in the drop down. So when you're configuring your platform, you do have the option to select any of those four rev schemes. Um, the revision scheme is selected um, in the life cycle and collaboration configuration option. Um, and you can see right here, there's three revision behaviors as well. There is a primary, primary and secondary, um, and then primary and secondary for 3D experience content with SOLIDWORKS Master. Um, and we'll kind of go into a little bit of that. And I know that there, there are um, updates that also take place in the environment. So some of these things do change as we have updates uh, on the cloud platform. So primary and secondary revisions. Um, so really, I want to, uh, I kind of want to preface something here with primary and secondary. So typically people will just have primary revisions. Um, you can have a primary and secondary revision if if you kind of work in a in an iterative environment, um, you know, if if you have a a model and you want to have several different um, instances of something, right? So you can create rev a, a rev a an a dot one a dot two a dot three a dot four. You can create a bunch of different revs at that point, right? If you work in an iterative process and maybe none of those are released, all of them are in work. You just want to have them all open and available. Maybe people need to look through those before they get approved. And then maybe you figure out which one you actually want and release that one. So maybe A.3 gets released, right? If you don't have an iterative process um, and you just kind of go from one to the next, uh, you probably won't need a secondary revision. Um, so really here, the primary revision is incremented every time a revision is created, okay? Independent from the maturity state of the object. So this is the recommended revision scheme um, if you don't have an iterative cycle. Um, the primary revision is incremented every time a revision is created from the released content. So when you have something released and you create a new revision, it'll go to the next letter or number, whatever the scheme is that you have. Um, the secondary revision, I believe, uh, in the latest version actually does not exist anymore. So it will just say A, B, C. You will not have a uh, dot one any longer unless you choose primary and secondary revisions. Um, so the secondary revision is incremented every time a revision is created from a non-released state, okay? So if something is in a release state and you rev it up, it will go to the next major rev. So you'll, it will go to the B or the C or the D or the one or two or three. The only way to get a secondary revision increment, meaning that dot one, dot two, dot three, is if you're incrementing an object from an in-work or a frozen state. Okay, so that's pretty important to just make sure you understand is that if you want that secondary rev to be prevalent and if you're using that, um, you do want to be incrementing the rev from an in-work or frozen state in order to increment that secondary. 
And when we're done with this, if you guys have questions, you can feel free to ask. Okay, so accessing revisions. Um, there's multiple ways that you can access uh, your revisions um, from the environment. Um, there's a web client that you can access it from and the SOLIDWORKS client. So this, this image here is just your web client. So when you're doing a search um, from the web client, all the revisions of an object are going to be displayed in the search results. Uh, you can see that on the first search result. Okay, You're seeing all the revs. If you want to limit your search result to only show the latest rev, there is an option for that. It's just a quick setting change. So on the right side there, you can see there's an option right there where it says search results revisions. You click that drop down and you have an option there. So right now it's all revisions in this image. If you change that to latest or latest per state, you will only see um, the latest rev. You will not see all the previous. It doesn't mean they don't exist. It just means you're not going to see them in your search results. Okay. Um, another common way to access the revisions for an object is to use the collaborative lifecycle application. Um, so once you're in that widget or, or app, um, the user can find the object they want to see revisions for, and they can view them all in one area. I know it's kind of small, so I apologize for that. But you can see that app. Once you pull up any of the revs, you will see the remaining revs all in one spot. Okay. So you don't have you can use a search like you see in the upper left image and you can use the collaborative lifecycle app that you see in the bottom right as well to see all the revs and you can toggle between revs um, right from there and that collaborative lifecycle app if you click that down arrow you can toggle between all the revs okay so this is accessing revisions through the solidworks client okay so when you're in solidworks you're using solidworks you have your connector up this is how you're going to be able to access multiple um, revisions. Okay, so when you're in SOLIDWORKS, you're just going to be able to see all the revisions of the CAD object by doing a replace by revision command. Okay, so if I, in this example, I have a, an object called Clip Swivel. Okay, so when I pull up that object and I have that up in SOLIDWORKS, I'm on Rev D right now. Okay, um, if I want to see other revisions that are available for Clip Swivel, I simply would right click on Clip Swivel. You click on replace by revision, and then a pop up on the right will show up. Okay, and then you can see all the other revs that exist for that object. Um, if you want to go into C.1, you click on C.1, and it'll open that up in your SOLIDWORKS um, window. Okay, and if you need to go back and forth, you can keep doing a replace by revision and go to the next one. So it's really easy to be able to toggle between uh, your revisions by using this feature. Uh, one other thing is transition rules. Um, so you can set up transition rules for revisions. Um, you can apply a rule to, I mean, this is an example. Um, you could apply a rule to prevent the promotion of an object if the governed children of the main object are not in the correct state. Okay. So if your main assembly uh, is in an in, in in-work state, um, but your children, right? So all the subcomponents and, and the parts within that assembly, or maybe they're in a draft state or whatever it may be, okay? You can use this rule that says, hey, you can't promote that assembly until all these children are at the correct target state, okay? So you can put that rule in. Um, for example, like I said, if you have an assembly that has children parts in it, you know, the assembly will not go from in work to frozen or from frozen to released if the children are not in the same state. Um, this just obviously will prevent any kind of confusion. So you can see that down below. Um, that's the transition rule. So when you go into the engineering definition section um, in your configurations, um, so this is in your collaborative spaces control center, um, you go into engineering definition and you can add this in there. Okay. You'll see all the transitions. You can add any custom rules that you want in that point. Okay, so we have revisions with uh, within bookmarks. Okay, this is also something that's uh, pretty important to, to make sure you understand. Um, when setting up bookmarks, it's important to remember that only the revisions you saved within the bookmark are going to show. Okay, so if a new revision for an object is created outside of the bookmark, that new revision will not be accessible from the bookmark itself. The new revision needs to be added to the bookmark. Now, I think with the latest update, um, there is a pretty cool option, and I'll kind of talk about that here in a second. 
Um, so you can see the column labeled is last revision would be marked with the green check mark if you have the latest. Um, this is just something to keep in mind as you have new revisions of the objects that come in. Okay, so if there's a new revision that comes in and it's not in this bookmark, you will get that red X. Okay, in the is latest last revision, you will get uh, a red X to let you know, hey, there's a new revision. Um, in, in the newest update, I believe you have a, an option to right click on that um, and you can actually grab the latest from here. So, uh, and that is all, all is lost, right? You don't have to go back and search and, and add something in. You can do it pretty simply right from here if you don't have the, the latest rev. Um, another thing too is you can have um, revisions, right? You can have like rev A of this object in a bookmark, you can have Rev A in a different bookmark, you can have Rev B in multiple bookmarks. So it doesn't matter. Um, it's not uh, it's not doubling up, right? So you can have multiple revisions in multiple bookmarks. There's no there's no cap on that. Um, it's just basically linking to your object. Okay, so I think I've gone through uh, everything I, I wanted to kind of go through very quickly here. Um, does anyone have uh, any questions? Brian, I don't know where the questions are if they come up. You might have to help with that. Yeah, that's that's one of the uh, the limitations we've discovered. You, the panelists don't get to see the oh. questions, but uh, but none of them are. I don't have any questions to, uh, okay. to ask you. Uh, okay. but we might give them just a minute to um, kind of absorb the the information that you've shared here. Um, if you do have a question. Um, after we kick it to our next presenter, uh, please go ahead and still type that in the question panel. Um, and if, um, worst case, I'll have Ritesh, you know, get back with you individually to, to answer those. But um, please do add those if you do have any questions. Um, is there anything else you want to cover, Ritesh? Or? I mean, uh, definitely. But uh, <laughs> I mean, we don't have enough time to go through. I think if I go into anything else, it's going to start going on pretty long. Sure, sure, sure. Actually, I do have one question that just came in here, uh, Ritesh. It says, um, do you prefer initial releases of, or at Rev0 or Rev1? They said initial releases, that was a question? Yes. Um, so, I mean, I think best practice, I mean, a lot of people, what they do is, if you're using a numbering scheme, right, um, you go with zero, if you're doing that. And if you're doing the ABC scheme, I think there's an option for a dash as your initial. Okay. So zero for number scheme and yep. dash for letter alpha scheme. You got it. Okay. Perfect, thank you. Yep. All right, um, if we don't have any other questions, uh, Kevin, if you are ready to go, I will go ahead and uh, switch you to be presenter. Thank you again, Ritesh. I think this was some really good information. Absolutely, thank you, everybody. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, let me. Yeah, I'm switching over to you now, Kevin. Uh, Ritesh, if you want to just stay on and uh, if anything else comes up, I'll let you know. Absolutely. Okay, we see your screen, Kevin. So um, if you want to do a quick intro and uh, off you go. Sure. Um, <clears throat> well, thanks, everybody. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, of course, I get a tickle in my throat as I go to start talking. But. Um, so I'm here to talk to you a little bit about the uh, user experience design team here at R&D um, and to make an invitation to have you guys join us in sharing your feedback. Um, so this group especially, since you guys are, are interested in uh, you know, 3D experience topics, um, we, we have a big need for getting your feedback. If you're, if you're using these tools, um, we'd want to get, get your feedback uh, into the product. So, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our process, the kinds of things we do, um, a little bit about how you can get involved, and um, we'll go from there. Uh, so obligatory giant picture of me. Uh, so <laughs> this is me. I'm the user experience design director um, for SolidWorks. Um, and so I report directly to uh, Manish Kumar, who's now the SolidWorks brand CEO and Vice President of R&D, uh, amongst other titles. Um, but, um, and I've been here, I was just realizing today, 13 years now. Um, I started at SolidWorks in 2009 as a, a user researcher, so doing the job that I'm asking for help with. Uh, I started as a UX designer in 2012 for SolidWorks, the, the product that we, you know, everybody knows SolidWorks for, um, gets installed, that's, that's the one. Um, 
and I started leading uh, a team focused on that the SolidWorks desktop products in 2014. Um, and then if any of you guys knew uh, Jim Wilkinson or Tom Spine, my, my predecessors, um, when Jim, well, Tom retired in 2017 and then Jim retired in 2018. So uh, I took over the, the group from them. Um, and if you guys do know Jim, he's happily hiking all over New Hampshire. And I think he was in Switzerland last, last month. So uh, he's doing great. <laughs> um, so if you've done any usability testing or alpha testing with us at SolidWorks or at, at SolidWorks World or now 3D Experience World in the past 13 years, um, you've probably interacted with me in some way. So if we have, uh, you know, nice to see you again. If we haven't, um, great to meet you and, and I'm here to invite you to, to help us out. Uh, so, you know, put the bobs here. What would you say you do here? Uh, I always like to to give people a, a little introduction as to what the user experience design team does, um, how we fit in with the rest of R&D, um, and you know what what our impact is um, to you, the, the folks that are trying to use the products that we create. So within R&D, you know we have um, a product management team that's like, where are we going? You know, what's the market? What are the needs in the marketplace? What what do people need? What what kind of tools do they need for, to complete their engineering tasks? Um, we also have a product definition team. These are the guys that if you go to 3D Experience World, they're the ones giving the hands-on sessions or many of the hands-on sessions. Um, and they're focused kind of on the feature level. Many of them are old, are, are you know, former SolidWorks users who we've hired. Uh, many of them were the loudest SolidWorks users who we've hired to, to work on uh, defining that part of the product. So what features should we have? What kinds of fillets should we have? You know, what, what, what should be in there? What are the things that people trying to create products need? Um, and then UX design is, is kind of like, how should it work, right? Um, you know, SolidWorks has a, a feature manager tree and a command manager uh, ribbon bar and shortcut toolbars and, you know, the S key, those things. All of that is is what we do. How, how do we, you know, stitch together all those features um, to make them, you know, easy to use, easy to learn, easy to master. Um, and then, you know, there's other groups too, right? Development is the, the all the, our software engineers who actually build it. We have a QA team that tests it, make sure it's working properly. Documentation team that explains it, creates the help. Um, and a localization team that, that does translation. There's many others. This is kind of a simplification. But these three really work closely together to determine, you know, what's needed, what's out there, and, and how it should all work together. Um, so some of the folks that we have, like our team, um, the bulk of my team is, is made up of uh, user experience designers. These are the folks that are looking at the workflows, right, step by step. I need to add a fillet to, you know, my part. Um, how do I want to do that? What are the things uh, in the property manager that should be there? What are the what are the selection steps? What are the things that need to happen to make that happen? Um, we look at those interactions, what you click, what you see, what are, what are your expectations when you do it. And we, we generate lots and lots of concepts that we throw away um, up until the point that we are helping to generate specs either completely ourselves or, you know, again, in concert with the product definition folks, the, the engineers and, you know, mechanical engineers and experts that we have on our team that, um, you know, help make sure that user voice is included. Um, we also have a number of graphic designers that do visual design. They look at those workflows. They look at, um, you know, how our products look, how they fit together in a cohesive whole. They also do um, icons for all the commands and things that we have. Um, and then also the focus of today is, is we have a, a couple of user researchers on the team um, and they help the rest of this team kind of plan, conduct, share the results of our research and testing of designs. Um, and this is where you know, you, our users come in, right? We want to show prototypes to you. We want to show, um, you know, potential upcoming designs to you. We want to test things that are out there now that we wish were better. Um, and so these folks will, you know, help find people, um, sit down with them, watch them use it, gather those insights. We put together reports and things for the team to consume and to, uh, to use to make changes to the software. Um, and a little bit about our process. I mean, I think it's pretty similar to, you know, any design, 
process, right? It could be generic. Um, so we go through a discovery and planning phase where we try to find out, you know, who's this for? What's what problem is it solving for them? Why why are they using this versus you know a, a pen and paper? Um, we go through and we try to understand, you know, what those problems are and how how people are solving them currently. Um, we do a lot of conceptual design, which is, you know, pen and paper, throwing away things, trying out, trying out ideas, and then we get to the point of detailed design where we have a spec. Um, and then that validation and evaluation phase. So our visual designers kind of come in in these two middle pieces, um, but then the researchers are really helping us throughout the whole thing. And again, um, that is again where we want to get users right we want to get we want to talk to you at the discovery phase when we're trying to understand the problem we want to talk to you guys as we're validating which approach we should take we want to talk to you when we've decided on an approach and we want to understand it and then we like to do things like beta and alpha testing um, at the end once it's coded just to, to make sure hey should should we actually be shipping this so and again it's all iterative right we go go back and forth through these through these phases um, so again, what's the problem? What are the big high level approaches? Um, and then, you know, what are all those necessary details to, to get there? Um, and through that, you know, with our users, we do all kinds of studies and activities. So we might do focus groups at World, we might send surveys out to you guys. Um, obviously, with the pandemic, we've been doing lots of things like phone interviews and Zoom calls, um, set up a screen share, turn it on. Um, you know, have have a user try something out that they might be familiar with and then give us feedback. We want to see what you do. We want to hear what you think. Um, and we want to use that to help inform making a, a better, better design. Um, we also, during the concept phase, we might do all kinds of other stuff. We have things like card sorting where we have you know, a whole bunch of, of categories, things we want you to sort into different categories to help us understand what your model is, you know, how your brain thinks about things. Um, there's there's all sorts of things that, that we do here. Again, also sometimes usability tests with prototypes of not quite working code. And then um, again, lots of usability testing once we're kind of ready to, to go. Um, so some of our big design principles, and, and again, these are all things that we've kind of codified after talking to lots and lots of customers and lots and lots of users of, of SOLIDWORKS tools. Um, first off, we try to keep the focus on the model and not our user interface. And this is something, you know, we, we've got lots of great stuff inside SOLIDWORKS and, and, and in the platform too, but we realize that you guys are here to do a job, not um, play with the tools that we've created, right? So while mouse gestures and the S key and how we do search are, um, you know, very important to us, um, how you do your job is most important, right? Um, so you don't necessarily care about those things except for the fact that they're making you faster or helping you get your job done more efficiently. Um, the other thing is efficiency is really important, right? Every click, every motion, every touch, really counts. We try to minimize travel. We try to minimize travel around the, the screen. We try to minimize the need for you to shift gears, you know, mentally to move from one task to another. So things like, you know, when we added um, breadcrumbs to the, uh, to the graphics area to allow you to kind of get that contextual view of the feature tree in an assembly based on what you clicked, um, the ability to bring that close to your, to your mouse cursor and uh, make selections. Um, that, that's a great example of, a, of an attempt to do that. Um, and then finally, you know, no two users are alike, right? We, we allow a lot of flexible customization in SOLIDWORKS. Um, and that's a principle we're trying to bring along um, with our cohorts in the, in the 3D experience platform. So we're pushing the idea of doing more customization, allowing you to kind of set up your environment the way that you want, the way that, that um, will help you work efficiently. Um, so those are kind of the big principles that we use to, to guide things. And, and again, we focus on the user. So the two things I want to kind of pitch today are, um, you know, we, we go out and do uh, customer visits. And this helps, you know, so the, actually the three teams I mentioned all do quite a few of those. 
Um, so any of us are great, and sometimes we'll come together, and sometimes we'll come together with uh, with representatives from your reseller as well. Um, but it helps us build empathy for what it is you're trying to do, right? So we love to come out to customer sites, especially now that that um, hopefully the pandemic is be getting in in the rearview mirror. We want to come out. We want to understand what you're trying to build. We want us to, if you're willing to let us sit down and watch you model for a bit, we'd love to do that. We want to see the shop, you know, understand the the things you're trying to do. If you're trying to bend metal, shape metal, um, if you're building furniture, we, we want to see those processes. We want to see and understand how SolidWorks fits into that um, and really get a get a feel for that, that context of use. Um, and then the other thing is that research and usability testing stuff, and often you can do that from your desk, you know, over Zoom at lunch. Um, it gives us the authority to discuss the designs and say, yep, this is the right thing to do. Our, we've tried it with customers, we've tried it with users, and, and yeah, it's going to work. Um, gives credibility to those opinions. Um, it keeps us accountable, right? Uh, I think my team, especially when we're designing things, right, you, you tend to be convinced that you're right. Um, and there's nothing more humbling than watching seven or eight people struggle with, with those assumptions that, that you made um, where you were wrong. So we'd rather do that, um, you know, before things are, are shipped. Um, and it really puts the, the voice of our users, you know, at the center of our decisions, right? Um, we've had a lot of good luck in the last year with all the way up to, you know, Bernard Charles was listening in, you know, listening in, asking for weekly updates on some of the research that we were doing um, last year uh, with um, with 3D Experience SolidWorks. So uh, there's a lot of great excitement that happens here at, at DS around this too. So we, we want to take advantage of that. We want to um, help you guys get that voice. So um, here's the pitch. The call to action is we want you guys to participate, especially this group, because with many of you, like I said, you're using, uh, you're, you're using the platform or you're starting to use the platform or you're interested in the platform. Um, we want to, you know, we, we need your voices to help us shape that future, right? So we do this a number of ways. Like I said, um, sometimes we have testing in Waltham. Actually, this week we we have um, kind of a beta event going on on campus. There's Right before this, I was over with 20 customers leading a research session. We were talking about um, how those customers collaborate both um, internally and externally, you know, within their engineering teams, but also externally with vendors and suppliers. We were talking about how they search for and organize their their CAD data. So, um, you know, just just that was happening this this morning. Um, like I said, we do a lot of remote sessions via, via screen sharing, and especially with things in the last two years, we've gotten very good at using Zoom for this. Um, and you just take over our keyboard and mouse. Um, it's it's pretty simple. So, you know, I think it's about the same level as watching a webinar like this. You might have to work a little bit harder because we ask you to think out loud and talk us through what you're seeing. But um, other than that, it's it's pretty pain free. Um, and then also we do, you know, if you come to 3D Experience World, um, I think this year we're in Nashville, um, we do lots of live sessions um, during that where you come sit down next to somebody from one of our teams and try things out. Um, and again, give feedback and we typically have cookies and muffins and stuff. Um, we are just about to launch a survey that will allow people to sign up for this, but it wasn't ready yet by today. So. Um, you can use my email address, kevin.bernie at 3ds.com, or this one, usability.ux at 3ds.com. That one goes to actually a couple of people, so we will definitely get it. Um, and if you're interested, and like I said, this group, especially since you guys either are um, attempting or trying things out, uh, or you're you're already using you know the platform or the roles that that involve the platform in some way, we're we're very interested in, in talking to you and getting your feedback. So. Um, drop an email to one of these, um, drop something in the chat, whatever. Um, I will make sure me or my team gets back in touch with you. And uh, that is it. I really appreciate the time. I really appreciate the pitch, uh, the ability to pitch to you guys. Um, hopefully, uh, you learned something about how we approach design here at SolidWorks. And thank you very much. And if there's any questions, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. Um, I don't see any questions yet, but just, I guess, a question for myself. Were you involved um, with the mouse gestures or adding that to the interface? 
I wish I could claim credit for all of it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, but that was that was actually my old boss, Tom Spine. But um, okay. did help him out quite a bit collaborating on the um, boom because I think maybe three or four. Oh God, it's five years ago now. We did yeah. a um, we we updated how uh, how you customize those with the drag and drop. So he did help okay. out with that project. Yeah. Yeah, I know from you know just myself being a, a SolidWorks user since '99, I you know was 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 more gravitated towards you know some key, key commands or two key commands or, or single uh, key commands um, just from my my prior experience to other CAT software. But then using the toolbars and and uh, the S shortcut key is probably my favorite interface. But um, never really grabbed onto the mouse gestures too much. Uh, but I appreciate the ability for SolidWorks and and uh, your teams to give us multiple ways to use the program you're not forced into doing it you know one way and that's the only way type thing so um there is one question it looks like um maybe uh we can answer now or you can answer later uh it's uh this is from thomas neff um says he's used to working uh both with solidworks and inventor for the past 10 years uh said he'd be very interested in getting in touch with the ux team so um, maybe I can give you uh, Thomas's email, Kevin, or he could send you an email, uh, which would probably be easier, and uh, you guys can maybe connect on that. Sounds great. Would love to talk. So, yeah, Thomas, if you wouldn't mind just shooting Kevin an email, uh, that'd probably be the easiest way to get in touch. Keep uh, keep me, the middleman, out of the way, okay. um, but um, would uh, would be interested to see what you guys come up with there. All right. Um, I think I see if we if any more come in, we'll I'll let you know, Kevin. But uh, I think we're good for now. Uh, Lisa, I might pass it over to you if you are available. And and thanks again, Kevin. Wow. I, I didn't know how this would be um, uh, received, but it's always neat to know that SolidWorks and DeSo care about customers and and wanting to you know help shape their guidance or utilization and, and and you know having both have a have a say in it which is which is always yeah. nice to hear yeah absolutely and we're we're having an impact on the the larger platform based teams too in fact we did a um a usability test with um some upgrades to search that i that are now available in in um, 22x fd03 so that new kind of federation that talks about you know uh uh, you kind of get the who, what, where across the top of the screen and allows you to kind of pre-sort your search results. That was all, uh, that's some testing we did with uh, with SolidWorks users. So um, cool. that's the kind of stuff that you can have an impact on. All right. Well, Lisa, we can see your screen. So if you want to uh, introduce yourself real quick and you're welcome to take it away. Hello. <laughs> I didn't put a picture on my slide, like so I figured I'd say hello. That way, when we are all in Nashville, you guys know where to find me. You know what to look for. So, definitely looking forward to being in person this year. There's actually business travel. It's all exciting, isn't it? But anyway, <laughs> just wanted to say hello and thank you so much for having me. So I feel I feel like um, uh, that segue for now for something completely different. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> So I'll turn off my video, but you guys can see my screen okay. So I, I wanted to talk about uh, bill of material management, you know, bond management with the platform, right? So uh, a big topic for me, uh, I've been in like like uh, the rest of you it's in the channel since 1999, right? I think that's what you said, Brian. Same thing. And I've been in CAD and engineering since I got out of school in the 80s, right? So long time i've been along this path and i'm happy to be here in the 3d experience platform <laughs> that's for sure so just real quick from a standpoint of just what all of us know to be true everything is an evolution whether you believe in this or not i don't want to get into that but <laughs> it's you know this is a slide everybody's familiar with the evolution of something and i would argue that we have been a part of the evolution of the bill of material right so for those of us who have been around back when you had to draw on a drawing board, you know, a bill of materials on the drawing. Some people use things like Excel. Certainly SolidWorks does a great job. Not sure if you have a hand in that, Kevin, but great job of bills of materials on the drawings, right? And then we have had our PDM Pro tool, you know, certainly brought a level of being able to do bills of materials well, bill of materials. And now we have the ability, a role for doing uh, bills of materials on the platform, right? So just a little bit about the platform and how 
what the the tool is and, and what a bill of material really is when you're talking about a unified product structure. So with the 3D Experience platform, for those of you who are using the 3D Experience platform, which should be all of you, is that you know that when you put CAD data, SOLIDWORKS data into the platform, you create something called a physical product. And then that physical product can then, it's not just relegated to things like the bond, it, you know, the simulation, the ability to use it for manufacturing roles, all of these things. That's why it's called a unified product structure. I think as a CAD user, this is great news for those of us who are SOLIDWORKS users. It allows the other roles to access the data without having to really access the SOLIDWORKS file and mess up anything that we may have done, right? So, so that's why I think it's great. And what you'll see in this, uh, in this um, presentation is that it allows non-CAD people to interact with the product structure. And again, uh, not necessarily mess up what we've done as CAD users. There's nothing worse, right, than having people muck around in their data. So with a unified product structure, the release engineering app, which is part of the product release engineer role, is basically a bill of material type viewing and editing of that product structure. So big difference here. It's not just the view. If you think back to, you know, um, when we used to hand draw the bill of material or, you know, um, uh, PDM Pro, it's, it, that was a view of the files to make it look like a bomb, right? This is really the product structure. So you can edit it. You do have the ability to modify it, the product structure. You're not gonna modify necessarily the content of files, but you, are, you can modify the product structure. So it is a tool that allows that. So the best way to tell, to show you, and I do have the product live, obviously, um, which I'll show you, but in the context of, of a story. So I do have a story to tell with some, um, with an engineering team using the particular tool just so we get all the functionality out without me forgetting something. And then I'll show you what it looks like and how we interact with it because it's changed a little bit since this uh, presentation was put together. But if we go back to some of these personas that we talk about, uh, this is a way for, so, so in the lower left would be our typical SOLIDWORKS engineer with the SOLIDWORKS add-in doing, you know, what we do with SOLIDWORKS and, and bring that valuable engineering information to the platform. And then we have Megan Manager in the upper left who may use just the browser. Maybe she's a Mac user and she only, you know, she only interacts or with a tablet uh, with the platform and is not a Windows or Windows tool user like our SOLIDWORKS user in the lower left, Eric Engineer. And then we also have Ben Business who is our procurement, um, you know, purchasing person who interacts with that product structure, project plans, um, has a lot of collaboration with us, but again, isn't our usual SOLIDWORKS user per se. So we're going to start. So this, the story of this particular team is that they've they've released the, their wheelchair um, for differently able people to get out into um, you know, mountain biking and getting into the wilderness. But now they'd like to come up with a, an assisted version of that, which is going to require what you see here, this handlebar uh, attached to the rear fender. It's going to require a different rear drive, meaning that, yes, our, our our user can pedal, but we also have the ability for them to be pushed if that's necessary. So this is a new product that we're going to make from existing product, which is very typical for us as engineers to do, right? Oops, I think I just turned on my camera by accident. So let's go take a look at our story. And I think my, my PowerPoint died. So off we go to Megan Manager. And you can hear me okay, right, Brian? Just checking. Yes, we're all good. Your camera's still on, but we good. can hear you certainly fine. Oh, my camera's still on too. Fantastic. Good to know. <laughs> off again. I don't know what I'm hitting. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, Technology uh, is fun, right? Yeah. So anyway, so, so what we're going to do is we're going to use a lot of the tools that you guys already know about, which is the markup tools. Uh, using the 3D markup capability, which is part of the, the Collaborative Industry Innovator, to mark up the goals, right? So this is Megan Manager, a non-SOLIDWORKS person, using the markup tools to say, hey, we're going to take this push handle assembly and attach it to the rear fender for this new version, this assisted version of the, um, the wheelchair, right? And it's my PowerPoint that keeps goofing on me, and I don't know why it's doing it, and I might have to bump out of it. 
again, but I don't get it. It was working fine for those of us who tried it ahead of time, like I did. So she takes a look at that markup, and this is really, um, she's gonna take a look at that markup, and what we wanna do is concentrate on this push bar assembly. So again, it's gonna require modification, it's gonna require modification to the drive, as well as the, the rear fender. And again, this is not product release engineer yet. This is product release engineer. So this is looking at the, you know, in this case, most of this data, probably almost all of it came from a solid works design, right? So all of this information came in through um, the connector. And here you have the ability to change what properties you see. Here you can see she added a thumbnail. You can, this is very much like an Excel spreadsheet. You can pick what properties show up, including the custom properties that you as SolidWorks users add to the system and also uh, reorder them. As you saw, you can drag and drop the columns. You can also sort the columns. You go ascending, descending, whatever you want. And we'll also see how we can change a display from a flattened view of all the component parts or leaves, as well as an indented view, what we call typically an indented view, it's a product structure view. So lots of ways to look at that data. So I'm looking at that rear drive and I know that we have to make a new rear drive assembly. So what we're gonna do here is that we have the ability that normally this would fall to a SOLIDWORKS user. Normally we would say, hey, we're gonna do this change. We need you to make this change. We need to make a new version of this. And what we want you to do is create this and you know, renumber it, create a new assembly and you know, off we go. And typically this would fall to the SOLIDWORKS user to say there's a new rear drive assembly and then it breaks all these connections and they end up you know, having to fix all of this. So what you're gonna see is a new strategy for this, right? To be able to, um, from the product structure itself, have somebody, a non-CAD user use the duplicate command. So this isn't, like I said, remember, it's not just viewing, it's editing and creating new. So what Megan is gonna do is she's gonna take the old rear drive assembly, which again, as we know, is a SOLIDWORKS assembly and use this duplicate command to do what typically users have to do, kind of a copy, save as, you know, we used to do that. But you see here, she's gonna choose to duplicate. There's different options. She's gonna duplicate the top, but duplicate with drawings and then just reuse the rest of it, right? So that means there's gonna be, she's not making new when it comes to all the other components. It's just a new top level drive assembly that's gonna include these um, uh, changes that we have. She also pulls an engineering number, right? She's gonna pull an engineering, uh, a new part number for this as well. So all of this done right from a uh, you know, web-based app from her tablet without having, and she actually did create a new SolidWorks assembly for that top level assembly, that AST rear assembly, when we did that duplicate, duplicated the SolidWorks data as well. So when Eric Engineer goes in to work on it, it already exists. Now in her case, she knows that that rear, we're trying to do this quickly because we have 20 minutes or less at this point. Um, so what she does, she knows instead, she could just send him off to create that new, but there is actually the new version of that fender already exists and she knows that. So she's gonna actually replace the rear fender with the either, it could be a new revision, a totally different part number, but in our scenario, it's actually a branch. So somebody has created a branch off of the rear fender, which is our AST version. So a branch is an ability to make a unique part derived from another part. So this happens to be a branch called A underscore 1.1. So she's going to use that particular component and put it into this new version of the AST assembly. She also can pull the compare app up at any point in time to make sure she's gotten the right part. So even though she's not specifically a SOLIDWORKS user, she does have the ability to physically, you know, graphically see the difference between them. So you see that bump up is the difference, right? And to also see the difference in properties between those two different parts. So now she's assured by using that compare tool. So the compare tool on the left, you're comparing the bill of materials. On the right, you're comparing graphically with the differences. So this compare, in this particular context, we're just comparing this fender um, in this uh, assembly, but you can do this between two totally different assemblies, two different revisions, whatever the case may be, you can use that compare tool. I don't want you to think the compare tool is just in product release engineer, it's not, um, but it's you can pull it up easily from this tool. The next thing she did there was just a search, which you're already a user of the platform, you know how to do, and she took a component, the push bar, handlebar retrofit, and dropped it right into this assembly, this uh, new rear assembly that includes that handlebar. So any way you know how to get that handlebar, you can add new um, 
components to this structure that she, this new structure that she's created. So she can also pick on that structure. So this allows you to climb up and down the structure. Uh, by the way, on the right hand side, I just have the regular 3D play viewer. Um, so in, in PLM terms, a lot of systems that I've demoed in the past, we call that climbing the tree. Climbing the tree, those are all live links on the left hand side. So that was that was done just by picking on one. I'll show you that live. But basically, she's looking at the handlebar assembly. You can drag and drop into the viewer. She's viewing the handlebar assembly. She knows it's the right one. She sees that everything is released, even though the handlebar assembly itself is in the in-work state. So without having to leave the product release engineer app, you know, kind of going back to the things that you know Ritesh was talking about, we have access to all the life cycle things, the revision control, all of that right from this app. So she's going to actually release uh, that handlebar assembly and let everybody know that that is now ready to go as well. So the other thing she can do is, if there are things that we didn't put into SolidWorks, those non-modeled items, instead of doing things like creating virtual parts, we can add engineering items that you can see here, volumes of material, drawings, um, specifications, things like that to the actual bill of material. In this case, what we have is we have lithium grease that needs to go into every box that we have. So what we're gonna do is actually create a new engineering item, which is a purchase part. In this case, it happens to be those um, this grease that we buy. So we can see here, we have the ability to name things, give it a description, um, give it you know a vendor name, and then go in here and actually change the quantity as well. Right, so this is a quantity of two. So just so you know, the product release engineer role is you know, the only role where you're gonna see quantity as a column um, and uh, when you're looking at the reference view for these guys, so just so you know. Uh, the other thing we can do is if we need to, we can add, um, um, we can change the maturity, this time we're gonna change the maturity state, but you can add documents and things if they're documents that should be in the box with the item. So taking care of everything that should be in the box. So now uh, we can go to changing the maturity state of the top level assembly, or actually here, we're just gonna sort by maturity state. So it's a way of grouping items and then setting in engineering item numbers. And again, my, my PowerPoint keeps failing and I don't know why, but it's a mystery of PowerPoint that will never be solved for me today <laughs> in 20 minutes or less. <laughs> but we can group here, we grouped by maturity state. So you can take that product structure and group it and view it in different ways. And in this case, pulling part numbers is something else that I wanna do. It's probably the PowerPoint's way of telling Lisa that she's been talking too long. Do you think that's what it's telling me? Probably. But anyway, and I'll show you what this looks like, but you can sort, you can sort it different ways. You can take a look at, you can pull part numbers, whatever you need to do, change life cycles. Here, we're gonna release all those items that are currently unreleased and even release the top level assembly. Okay, so having done all that, just want to keep in mind again, here we're taking a look at the assembly and using those 6W tags to colorize the display. So taking a look and colorizing the entire product, the, the structure, the bill of material based on, you know, the process, whether it's a make or buy part, the process specifications, you know, how, how much lead time we need for them. And then what we're doing here is creating a custom view for Ben Business, because this is the way that he'd like to look at that. So you can change what columns are visible. You can take a look and, and grab that and save that to a custom view for other people that view that bomb differently. And that's why it's important to realize that this is a view of the product structure. This is the ability to everybody to look at it the way that they need to. And the last important component is to be able to export it. So we can export this bill of material into a CSV file. Again, we'll be able to pick what that view looks like and export it to a CSV for downstream use by other users, other systems, whatever the case may be, right? So here we have our, our, our new version. Again, keep in mind, we did all of this. We made a new top level assembly, added an existing handlebar, the modified fender and drive assembly, and we did this all, Megan Manager was able to do it without firing up SolidWorks or anything. And she can see now that we're ready to go with our new design. So again, kind of shows better in the context of a story of what it looks like for people to use the tool, but I do have it um, up in live. I might have to refresh because I've been dormant for a long time. But again, for those of you who are familiar with what it means to look at a bill of material, this is me looking at um, an assembly that is a SOLIDWORKS assembly. It has come in from SOLIDWORKS, and this is just me taking a look at that. 
and uh, I've got it in the new 3D Navigate. I don't know if you know in the latest release of the software, you're not just relegated to 3D Play now. You can use 3D Navigate. You can um, disconnect it from the Explore, the, and so you can use it as your viewer, just so you know. So it is still, a, you know, a viewer. You can, you know, hide things and things like that, um, and um, you know, be able to manipulate the display. But climbing up and down the the structure again. If I want to look at a sub assembly in this thing or a component part, I can just pick on the item, and now I'm looking at that particular sub assembly. I can, you know, you know, highlight it in the um, in the viewer. I can take a look at component parts again, see who has it locked, who has who's the owner, change which properties that I'm seeing. So if you want to do things like turn on the thumbnails, or you wanted to actually go get your uh, custom properties that you've brought over from SolidWorks. You can add those as well. So let's say I just turn on that thumbnail like we did in the viewer and I can reorder these, you know, and change that display. I can go back up a level, right, by going, you know, backwards up a level. Uh, again, the ability to display it either, right now I'm looking at a product structure, but the sub-assemblies aren't exploded, right? So if I go over here and say I want to, I can either say expand all levels of this assembly, or if it's very large, I could, choose a certain number of levels to expand. So I could just expand one level to see what that looks like. So you can see this particular assembly, you know, has a lot of component parts, but it's made up of several different sub-assemblies, right? So again, the ability to view that this way, see quantity, the number of instances for each of these things I have. Um, and then the other option is that you can look at it, it's called product leaves, but this is really called, this is, think of this as the flattened bomb view. So instead of seeing an indented bill of material, so with the sub-assemblies represented, if I just wanted to see all of the product leaves, just all of the children flat, I can do that as well. So here you can see I'm just seeing a flattened bill of material. In this case, it would add up, let's say this quantity of 10 comes from three different sub-assemblies. You'd see all 10 here, right? And again, the ability to do that export, you know, you can export from... Um, from um, the, the tool and you know that's the actual item itself sorry um, and be able to um, get that information out into an excel spreadsheet into a csv file so again just a quick rundown of capabilities that we have um, it is the product release engineer role it is that view of the bill of material that of the product structure that makes it look like a bill of material it has a ton of capabilities of being able to you know group things um you know by what maturity state they're in things like that um who's the owner so if you if you were that megan manager and not the like i am the creator of all this data look at my face uh but if you were like megan manager with many different people contributing to a large assembly being able to sort it by what's currently in work what's released things like that all of that's very important to be able to do, right? Um, and you can also change to a usage view. Usage view, what that does, that is the equivalent of instead of um, instant, like the reference view, which shows you quantities, this is actually blowing it out to every, so if there's four of those or 10 of those, it's gonna show you all 10. So you can see usage views, you can see, um, uh, you can see usage views, reference views, um, exploded views, whatever the case may be that you need to do. So that was really everything that I wanted to cover, and that gives me two minutes left. Sorry, Brian. Yeah. <laughs> no, thanks. <laughs> thanks, Lisa. That was good stuff. Thanks for navigating the uh, wonderful world of PowerPoint. Um, we did have one question uh, that I, I I don't know if you can answer, but I, I figure I'll go ahead and ask you anyway. Can you explain uh, briefly the benefits of 3D Navigate over 3D Play? Um, the one thing I could tell you is if you're used to using 3D Navigate, there's the advantage is you're used to it. You know, 3D Play is a little different. You know what I mean? So the user interface is just a tad different. So um, I personally am so used to 3D Play, it doesn't really give me a ton of benefit. But if you're used to using 3D Navigate, I don't know if the tools vary wi wildly or not, if it's more accurate, the, the measurements are more accurate than 3D Play might be one of the advantages. Um, yeah, 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 just like point to point. Um, I'm, I'm not 100% why they made that that change yeah that's but, okay we can we can dig into it a little deeper i just yeah. figured uh, that was one of the questions that came in that i thought yeah. i'd ask you real quick 
Yeah, and 3D play, the complaints with 3D play is that it's not got accurate um, dimensions and, and things like that um, that you get with like 3D markup. Um, okay. And yeah, it's just a little different experience, but I can, like I said, if I, if I grab 3D play, put it on there, we could see the differences physically, right? Put it right in the middle. And just because we're close to time, um, I did want to mention one more time for those of you still in the in the webinar, uh, there is a uh, a handout that you can download that goes into more detail with the product release engineer uh, role yeah. that uh, that Lisa's been showing us here. So if you want more information, feel free to grab that. Uh, any other questions that are not in the chat right now or in the question box, uh, feel free to uh, submit those, and uh, I can get those to the correct parties. Yeah, they do look a lot alike other than maybe I think, interface. I think that Navigate is uh, supposed to be optimized for really big things, really okay. huge assemblies. Like it, it's got, I think it's set up to like load data differently and more carefully. Okay. Yeah, and there are some different a 747 options. maybe. Or <laughs> but you do, have, you do have the ability to do stuff like hide things and everything, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. All right, we are at our time limit or just a hair over, but uh, I appreciate all three presenters today um, and those that attended. Uh, we will have another meeting next month as well as a poll that you should be seeing uh, upon exit, uh, should come to your email. Uh, we want to know what you want to see next. So please fill out the poll, answer the questions and um, help drive the next meeting. We've done a pretty good job of trying to pick uh, information that we think is relative and and that uh, people would get information from but um it this is meant to be a user group so I let the users uh, uh put their voice and, and see where we go from there uh, but again a quick thank you to the team um and i will close this webinar thanks a lot thank you thank you